Hi to everyone. Welcome to this joint webinar of M plus P and Kistler on practical consideration of force limited vibration testing. Please be aware that you are muted for purpose and that this webinar is recorded. The recording will be shared and sent off to the webinar. If you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A section on the right hand side. We will answer your questions during the webinar or at the very end. My name is Pascal Erne and I'm business <coughs> sorry and I'm business development manager at Kistler for test and measurement. Today we have two highly experienced personalities who will share their knowledge with you. On one hand, we have Chris Wilcox from Amplus P, sales manager and being in the business for more than 22 years with experience in vibration testing of large spacecrafts vibration control, model and general data acquisition, thermal vacuum operation, and acoustic testing in different positions as test, test, <coughs> test technician, consultant, account, and sales manager. On the other hand, uh, we have Bill Zwolinski working for Kistler for more than 20 years. Bill holds a master's degree in elect electrical engineering, specializing in signal processing and controls. Before joining Kistler, he was working in the field of underwater acoustic and was chief engineer for the Navy carrier landing system at Textron. With his enormous knowledge in electronics and mechanical engineering, he completes this enormous load of knowledge for this webinar. And now I do not want to take more of your time and would like to hand over to you, Bill. Uh, thank you, Pascal. Okay, so. Um... So I'd just like to review quickly uh, our agenda, which was uh, published. Uh, basically, I will uh, address uh, you know basics of force limited vibration, basics of uh, of, um, of multi component force measurement, installation, mounting, checkout, uh, and a brief application example. And uh, Chris uh, Wilcox will be handling the vibration control topics you see uh, listed. So we expect it to be a very informative uh, meeting. Please. Uh, Send your questions to Pascal as uh, as we move forward. We're happy to answer as we can. Well, just as a little background, okay. So, uh, so the uh, life of a of a payload is uh, quite uh, quite quite uh, a, 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 a rough journey uh, from launch to deployment, and uh, part of this uh, really is really understanding some of the challenges in terms of uh, testing and uh, testing. Uh, 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 payloads so that they could survive this uh, this difficult environment. As you can see uh, in the launch area, that uh, that it has fairly high vibrational content, and then you have uh, periods where you have uh, uh, transient uh, events that are you know basically related to the separation events of various uh, stages. So it gives you a, a, at least a perspective anyway of what we're trying to achieve here in terms of a, a force limited vibration test is really. Uh, working to uh, to ensure that the uh, payload survives and uh, survives the launch and deployment and is operational when it's in flight. Uh, environmental testing, I think you heard Chris's uh, resume, pretty impressive. Uh, he was uh, pretty much part of a lot of these uh, types of environmental tests that you see uh, listed here that are quite common in, in uh, testing payloads. So, um, so we're going to be talking more on the vibration side, force limited vibration. But there's certainly a, 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 a suite of, of testing that's uh, that's regularly done uh, on payloads that just be aware of. Um, as far as a force limit of vibration test, I mean this is just a, a, a rendering of a of a of a system at a customer location. It's basically a, a slip table with uh, with a, a force sensors mounted on the uh, on the base. And then you have a test article mounted uh, to the uh, force sensors, and this is basic the basic concept of a force limit of vibration. You're instrumenting the interface between the shaker and the unit under test with force sensors to uh, to measure the fixed base resonances uh, during uh, vibration testing. Uh, there are a wide range of uh, of elements uh, that go into this, from uh, sensors to signal conditioning, accelerometers, uh, head expanders, and obviously, uh, you know, the shaker controller uh, software and uh, data acquisition system. 
Just an example, uh, uh, this comes from um, uh, the GLASS mission uh, where it was actually instrumented with accelerometer, accelerometers and force sensors, just to give a, a feeling for what type of acceleration and forces come into play during launch and flight. But you can you can see that the uh, that that uh, the acceleration forces are are quite considerable um, in terms of uh, of the levels that we see, and certainly in the acceleration you're seeing on the order of a, a quarter g uh, peak at the lower frequencies and in, in uh, force you're seeing upwards of uh, 23 kilonewtons, uh, 5,000 pounds, 5,100 pounds in terms of force at at various frequencies as well. So, so I think you can appreciate the, uh, the the magnitude of the test anyway in terms of the amount of force and acceleration that the uh, that the uh, that the payload actually will see. So, in terms of uh, traditional vibration testing, really controls the input acceleration to the frequency envelope of the flight flight data, uh, but limiting the te test acceleration responses to those predicted in flight. It's highly dependent on analysis and usually requires uh, limiting acceleration responses at many locations, which is, uh, you know, quite challenging. And you can see here the uh, uh, another schematic of a, a force limit vibration test, where you have your shaker system, data acquisition, and, and uh, vibration controller, sensor signal conditioning, which could be charge amps, test article, force sensors, and accelerometers as well. So, ultimately, uh, limiting the input force at the fixed base resonances of the unit under test is less dependent on these uh, analytical models and provides an automatic notching uh, without uh, over testing. So, what we're, what we're trying to achieve here is the force limiting is really trying to achieve it to replicate the test article resonant, re resonant response for actual flight mounting condition. The actual flight mounting condition is actually on a, I'll say, a more compliant uh, structure. Uh, than, a, than a shaker. A shaker is uh, probably near infinite uh, mechanical impedance, whereas the uh, the uh, compliance structure is much less in in in, in terms of uh, how the payload is actually mounted in the fairing. So it's important anyway to I think appreciate the uh, the background at least in in terms of why we're doing force limiting, and certainly with uh, all these inputs, you need a, a fairly sophisticated uh, um, extremal control system that looks at uh, uh, many inputs uh, and uh, limits uh, based upon the maximum of those those inputs. Okay, so uh, you know conceptually uh, at frequencies other than the test item resonances, you you you, you are controlling on the test item uh, acceleration response. Whereas at test item resonances, at the base reaction force increases, you're going to control on those uh, force uh, control specifications. So. Uh, and the force control limits are, are basically based upon le legacy data analysis and certainly added safety margins. An example, another example from uh, NASA report 1403 is really, really just showing uh, schematically at least what we're trying to achieve here. And then in this case, you could see that uh, an unlimited input force could be upwards of 10 dB higher than the, uh, than the uh, envelope. And at that point, that would uh, act to overtest the, uh, the the payload. By placing a force limit by monitoring the fixed base resonances, you're able to then equalize that and make sure that you don't get any excessive forces or an, and uh, acceleration into the structure uh, under test. So now what we're going to do is go into a little bit of, of, of the force uh, uh, background anyway. We're going to be talking more on the... Uh, uh, multi-component force sensors, obviously three-component force sensors, and then multi-component uh, uh, force uh, comprised of several of these uh, three-component sensors, and uh, basically be able to calculate six degrees of freedom, uh, uh, six components, forces, and moments with regard to uh, to the uh, test article. So uh, some terminology, piezoelectric PE and IEPE, I mean, there's two different types of of piezoelectric sensors. Uh, 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 piezoelectric sensors are known for uh, uh, rangeability because the charge amplifier is external. You get extre uh, uh, extreme control on, on range. Okay, you can optimize the dynamic range of the measuring chain quite easily using the external charge amplifier. Obviously, you can also use the charge amplifier to measure quasi statically. And this is uh, quite important as I showed you earlier, 
where you have these four sensors mounted on a shaker, you need to actually install those and preload those. And we're going to be talking a little bit about that. The preloading operation is actually requires a quasi static uh, amplifier. Um, uh, in terms of IEPE, this is where electronics is inside the sensor. And basically, these are fixed range sensors, basically uh, optimized for dynamic measurement, uh, not really able to do the quasi static uh, 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 task, but uh, primarily dynamic in nature. So uh, um, then we go to the uh, uh, piezoelectric and uh, IEPE sensor frequency response. Uh, basically, what you see here is the uh, on the low end is a uh, single order high pass characteristic on the high end is a lightly damped second order characteristic. This is uh, this this is very similar to most uh, or if, all, if not all uh, piezoelectric sensors. So what you're doing here is you're really, uh, you know, knowing the residence of your of your platform of your test platform. You could make some uh, some uh, determinations as to where your say operating frequencies might be. For example, based upon a second order, uh, lightly damped second order system, you can see the 5% amplitude response is, is approximately FN natural frequency over five, 10% FN over three, and the three dB would be FN over two. So, uh, so you can tailor your usable frequency range uh, of the dynamometer of your force platform to, uh, to give an amplitude tolerance based upon knowing that what the natural frequency is. Uh, on the low frequency end, we talked about high frequency. On the low frequency end, uh, you basically have to look at your charge amplifier or the electronics uh, in your system. And basically, uh, some charge amplifiers will uh, will vary the time constant. A time constant is basically given by this uh, S domain expression here. Tau is the time constant, and basically that dictates the cutoff frequency on the on the low end of the high pass filter. Okay, and there's various expressions here. So, so if you need to achieve a certain frequency, you want to ensure that your electronics is uh, is uh, set up properly to measure if it's one hertz, five hertz, fifteen hertz, or twenty hertz. Say on the low end, you want to make sure that you uh, taking care on uh, on the electronics to make sure that you have frequency response down there. In many cases, in in uh, charge amplifiers, you, you might see a different time constant or different low frequency characteristic based upon what measuring range you're at. So, so that's uh, somewhat important to keep in mind. In terms of quasi-static and dynamic measurement, well, what dynamic is just that. It's, uh, it's not going to measure a static event. Uh, you know, and what you see here illustrated is, uh, you know, two dynamic events. And this one here would be a constant, uh, say, force over a, a certain period of time. That would not be something uh, a dynamic charge amp would be able to do. Whereas a quasi static does both the dynamic and also has the ability to measure, uh, you know, static low frequency signals as well. And that's quite important when it comes to the preloading operation that I mentioned previously. So just some examples of what a charge amp might be. Okay, there's uh, several you know different uh, uh, configurations, of course. So you can go single uh, channel, multi-channel. Uh, what's often most important in in terms of charge amps is that you look at quasi-static capability, especially in a in a uh, in a force limited application. A lot of times you're using um, you know four sensors which need to be preloaded so that absolutely uh, contributes to the installation and mounting the other thing is actually the measuring range which is also important and depending on what type of test you're performing the measuring range comes into play and having a, a, a charge amplifier with a wide input measuring range is also quite important uh, bandwidth yeah the charge amps are going to have more bandwidth than any force limited Test will 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 ever demand, but it's often good to know at least on the high end that there's no issue. And as I mentioned before, on the low end frequency, you always need to take care and make sure the charge amp supports the lowest frequencies of interest. I mentioned rangeability, and in rangeability, uh, I just wanted to show this this simple example here. Uh, what an external charge amp does when you have a piezoelectric sensor is you're able to range. Although that sensor might be a 10 kilonewton sensor, you're able to range it full scale to different ranges. It could be 100, 1,000 newtons, 25, or even 1 newton. And what happens is the actual broadband no RMS noise actually reduces. 
as a function of, of range. So it's completely a scalable solution. So you actually get a reciprocal benefit in terms of noise, in terms of uh, going uh, to lower force ranges, uh, which is, I think, a really uh, a very helpful attribute using uh, 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 piezoelectric force sensors. Also with force uh, sensors, piezoelectric, it's very easy to tear out if you have a, uh, a huge mass on top of a force sensor, you could basically tear that out. So although the sensors see the mass or know a certain mass is acting upon it, uh, the measuring chain is optimized for, for the dynamic or quasi-static portion you're trying to measure. So again, you uh, in turn optimize the dynamic range of your system uh, for, the, uh, for the expected uh, excitations, which is uh, always a, an advantage to get the best uh, resolution and performance. In terms of other charge amps, uh, there are uh, digitally processed charge amps or lab amp series, which uh, offer a wide range of scalability, multi-channel options, as well as uh, um, you know, um, uh, scalability uh, for various uh, you know, uh, configurations. So uh, one thing I'd like to mention for force limited vibration is the rangeability is there in these types of ampl amplifiers also in a lot of the force limiting vibration applications, you might see, uh, you know, that all channels from the sensors are routed right to the uh, to the vibration controller. Well, these uh, lab amps uh, absolutely uh, uh, complement that and are able to uh, uh, output analog signals of high fidelity uh, with low latency that uh, provide uh, good control inputs to the uh, vibration controller. Obviously, and some folks actually like to have even a, a backup recording, you know, as a second source. Okay, so there's always a primary recording being done on the uh, vibration controller, but sometimes a backup recording. As these are data acquisition systems, there you can basically create backup recordings of your tests on top. So you have basically two sources of uh, of of of, of uh, uh, measurements of digital data measurements. So, in terms of force dynamometers, uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, the force dynamometer is going to really distribute the load amongst all the force sensors. Force sensors on their own, like axial forces. Well, in these complex uh, tests, you, you don't have axial forces. You have large platforms acting upon, you know, uh, force sensors. So, by having a dynamometer uh, arrangement, you're able to dynamically absorb these moment loads and forces and distribute them amongst the geometry of the sensors. Um, from an analog bandwidth consideration, it's always important to understand what bandwidth you're trying to test to, and that really is given by the test article, but also the charge amp will dictate how much uh, frequency content on the high end and low end you can do. And as I mentioned before, usually you can accommodate easily the uh, test requirements of a force limited test with a, with a charge amp. Lastly, and most importantly, is the fixtures themselves. The vibration fixtures need to be designed to accommodate, uh, you know, uh, achieving the resonant frequencies uh, of the test so that you can um, measure the, uh, the test article uh, frequencies of interest. So, so there's a, a fairly uh, involved amount of interactions between all these parameters, but it's very important to understand that vibration fixtures, test articles, and equipment all play a role in achieving the uh, the requirements of the force limiting test. Obviously, in terms of uh, installation and, and mounting, there's a lot of considerations associated with it. I'm uh, uh, instrumenting a, a force platform. I'm going to talk a few of these uh, in the later slides. Uh, before I get to that, I just wanted to point out some parameters. And certainly, you know, when you're doing a force limiting test, you know, selection of a sensor is always critical. Oftentimes, you you consult your local, you know, specialist in the area, um, you know, and that's fine. But uh, generally, uh, I'll give some guidelines a little later on how you can sort of size the uh, force limiting uh, application to a given sensor. So that might help as well. But you see sensitivities, linearities. Linearity is a very important parameter because that affects overall accuracy. Better the linearity, the better the accuracy. Uh, crosstalk and multi-component force, you're always going to have uh, say, uh, you know, uh, situations where one force will, uh, will affect another axis and it's a, it's a small amount, but it, there will be some interaction. And then obviously characterizing all the stiffnesses of force sensors are absolutely critical. 
because there's a lot of FEA analysis going on when you put together this vibration fixture and uh, test article and trying to understand do you have the frequency range to accommodate the test. And that's always important. With these four sensors, again, they're going to need to be preloaded, and we'll talk about that. Um, if uh, your preloading isn't something uh, you wanted to take on, uh, there are four links, and these are preloaded at the factory, and they come with a calibration third already ready to go. They basically have a top and bottom flange that fit between two parallel, uh, flat and parallel plates. Okay, the basic um, you know parameters are the same. Okay, the key parameters are the same. And uh, again, uh, understanding the stiffnesses, and uh, I think is one of the main uh, goals when you look at your FEA analysis and trying to um, you know, confirm that you have the right fixture for the for the measurement, and that's key. And one thing I just wanted to mention here before I go on, what you see here is if you just look at axial stiffness, as you this sort of goes up from uh, low cap low uh, measuring range. To higher measuring range, okay, at the at the right side, you can see the stiffness actually increases sizably as you go up in the higher measuring range. And when you have an external charge amp, now even though your sensor might be 150 kilonewton range, you can easily range that to one kilonewton, and then take the benefit of the of the high stiffness as well. So there's a there's definitely some reasons to look at uh, you know sensors in terms of stiffnesses and. Uh, the number of sensors and the geometry of the sensors of your force plate in terms of achieving whatever performance goals you want. Uh, I wanted to give a simple example of a uh, of a of a dynamometer uh, of a square or rectangular dynamometer. What you see, and just to give you, I think, a little perspective, because we're going to also talk about more circular uh, uh, orientations as well. But what you see here is basically a rectangular orientation where you see four sensors. Separated by a distance a from the, you know, uh, from the center of the dynamometer and a distance B, uh, from the uh, horizontal to the uh, center of the dynamometer. Now, in, in this configuration, we actually uh, charge can be summed directly. So we actually do some charge summing to reduce the channel count. And instead of having ch 12 channels, we have 8 channels instead. Well, knowing this geometry, you can easily compute the closed form expressions for forces and moments, as shown below. And you say, well, how do you even get to those expressions? And what I wanted to do was, before I get to that, some charge amplifiers, by the way, also have summing calculators, which actually can resolve these uh, six, degree, six components directly in analog signals. So you, you might want to take a look at that if you're doing, uh, say, four sensor uh, configurations um, in your testing. So, how do you get to those expressions? And yeah, this looks like a very busy chart, but I just wanted to pick a couple cases here. If you wanted to look at the moment in X, what I've done here is I've grouped the two sensors on the on the left and grouped the two sensors on the right. And obviously we're looking at the interactions about X or the moment about X. And uh, what we do there is we're uh, combining these sensors and then offsetting them with the uh, with the sensors to the right to compute MX as well. And if you see, we're operating through the moment arm uh, of B, which is shown in this MX expression. For MY, you can see here, MY is here. We've grouped the sensors differently, but the equation is the same. Now we're working through the moment arm A, which is the vertical separation between the, the uh, uh, sensors and the uh, center of the dyno. And you can extend that as well to MZ, a little more complicated, but certainly the same concept. So fundamentally what you're doing with this uh, dynamometer geometry is you're using it now to not only compute the forces, but also the moments as well. So in traditional dynamometry, you're always looking at how do you calibrate? Well, at factories, you're always using very uh, you know, much a multi-axis presses with electric actuators, strain gauge uh, force sensors for, uh, for reference to control the force and then piezoelectric reference sensors to actually do the calibration. So fairly a well-known approach, uh, but obviously something like this is not uh, say readily available when you're putting together a vibration fixture uh, ready for a force limited test. So what do you do at that point? How do you calibrate? Well, that'll be a topic in the next few slides here and we'll touch upon that. 
But before we do that, I wanted to just talk briefly on um, on some basics here. With a uh, force limit or with any dynamometer, you always want flat and parallel uh, top and bottom plates. You want high stiff, high strength materials, and certainly you want good stiffness so that you get the best frequency response. With regard to preload and ground isolation, preloading is absolutely critical to a to a good and safe uh, uh, force limit of vibration test. Preloading optimizes on linearity and stiffness, closes the micro gaps inside the sensor. You get both the compressive and tensile uh, force handling capability, and also the shear force handling is, is transferred by the frictional coefficient times the preload force. And obviously shear force handling eliminates any slippage, and that is a, a, a very important requirement in a force limiting vibration uh, test. You also want to note that the uh, top of the sensors are are uh, ceramic uh, uh, based, which means that they're going to be having a high uh, frictional coefficient of 0.2, I think 0.21. So that gives you, uh, say, less force to achieve a certain uh, preload force to achieve a certain force handling, shear force handling capability. As I mentioned previously, you have linearity. Linearity is the is the uh, the goodness of uh, of input versus output. So if you have poor linearity, if you put a uh, one newton in, you might get a 1.1 newton out. That would be bad. That would be poor linearity. So linearity is a, is the fundamental error mechanism in most measurements uh, that we make. Okay, and temperature is another one, but in force limiting testing, temperature rarely uh, comes into play. Uh, there's also other uh, uh, things to consider when you preload. There's actually a shunt force. So oftentimes you want to use the manufacturer's preload bolt. If you do uh, use your own preload bolt, you'll have to you know take care on that because the, uh, the you basically have a uh, 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 the preload bolt is mechanically in parallel. So you, you're going to distribute the force over the bolt as well as the sensor. So the stiffer the bolt, the less force in the sensor, the less sensitivity of your sensor. So it's always important to uh, to to take care on on how you preload in terms of the materials of the bolt stiffness of the bolt and how much uh, uh, shunt force uh, you might achieve. As I mentioned before, tensile and compressive force handling, you uh, usually uh, preload to about 70% in a three component sensor, and that gives you the ability to measure uh, tensile and compressive. In terms of dynamometry, you always wanna make sure you're aligned, okay? So uh, these sensors might look round, but they actually have flats on them. And those flats actually come into play. You can use them to your advantage when building up your fixture to align the X and Y axes uh, properly. For every one degree of misalignment, you have a 2% crosstalk uh, in X and Y. So that's a, a sizable amount of crosstalk. So you always wanna uh, make sure you're aligned. And then I, as I mentioned, crosstalk is a spec on any uh, multi-component force sensor. Um, this is important obviously, but the real, uh, you know, there's two, Two things to keep in mind. One is there's always a spec on the data sheet, but the actual certificate, the calibration certificate you get from the manufacturer will have the actual uh, crosstalk. And quite often that is quite a bit less than what's on the data sheet as well. Just an example here of a, of a test that was, uh, that was performed uh, some time ago, uh, but basically how do you align you know, the sensor? And what you do is you want to make sure the sensor doesn't turn during a preload event. So in this case here, you can either use uh, dowel pins at the connector, or you, you know, as I illustrate here on the left, which two pins sort of surround the connector, and then you you can preload the uh, the sensor accordingly. Or in this case here, uh, this uh, customer actually used uh, metal flats or metal uh, pieces to align with the flats of the sensor, and basically as you torque them down, there was no way the sensor could rotate. And then after the sensor was all assembled or the fixture was assembled, these uh, pieces came apart and were no longer part of the vibration fixture. So creating a, a, a innovative fixture uh, that allows preload is actually uh, quite uh, important, I think, in terms of the overall uh, 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 task of, of mounting and installation, okay? Uh, and then uh, another one just with the uh, force sensor dynamometer, I mentioned preloading and with preloading, it's just like changing the tire of your car. You wouldn't take your tire off and then tighten up one bolt and then go to the other bolts and tighten up each bolt all the way. You, you tighten up each bolt uh, partially 
and go around and say a star pattern and, and uh, eventually, um, you know, accomplish the goal of, uh, of installing the tire. In this case, uh, what's normally done is you break up the, the, the amount of preload in a 25% increments and you basically do this star pattern uh, going back and forth four times in four cycles. What's really important when you preload is have a checklist sheet that says uh, each step that you're going to use, you're monitoring the Z channel uh, output of each sensor with a quasi static amp, and you're making sure that you hit a certain force output when you preload and you get a check mark on each step and or initial it. And that way there's no confusion as to how uh, much preload was was uh, was applied and you have a, a document that validates that your preload was done properly. Um, one thing I wanted to mention with any uh, uh, force dynamometers, it's a spring mass system. So in this regard, it's going to have, uh, if you add mass, you're gonna get less frequency response. So the natural frequency will reduce with added mass. That's also a, a important criteria when you do your FEA and when you do your um, you know, FEA on your fixture and test article, you want to understand how much mass is acting on the force sensors, and then do you still have adequate frequency response to do the test? And this is oftentimes where you consider, well, should I use a higher stiffness sensor to achieve a, a better overall frequency response in my fixture? And those are some of the parameters that are considered depending on what the uh, performance requirements are of the test. This is just a, an example uh, that NASA uh, did a few years back, a global precipitation measurement satellite. And just to give you a flavor for some of the, uh, this is a large observatory. And you can see, you know, head expanders, you got up to 3000 kilograms and higher of mass, of payload mass. The ring itself is a, around 160 ki kilograms. The frequency response of interest was only five to 70 Hertz. But uh, in this case, they used around 76 uh, millimeter top and bottom plate out of aluminum. The diameter ring was 2.6 meters, 12 sensors, uh, and a 25% uh, preload for each step and a star pattern was accomplished. In this case, NASA used their own bolts. Um, that, that was a very common method at, at, at the NASA facility we were working at. And um, anyway, yeah, that's... Uh, uh, a bit of how it looks in the installation and the four sensors are wedged between uh, right here, this uh, surface right here. And I got a picture later on on that. So what you see here is 12 sensors and you see that the, the math is a little more complex here. I showed you a simple case with four sensors. Well, with 12 sensors, you have more complex expressions and certainly uh, you can uh, extend this to N sensors for sure. And uh, it's basically geometry and how you uh, and your coordinate reference frame will allow you to determine uh, the force and moment expressions. And this is just a, a guideline for uh, finding out maximum shear forces, axial forces of, of your, uh, of your uh, force limited platform, how many sensors you use, what the uh, maximum force rating is of each sensor, what the bending moments might be, what the maximum overturning moment might be, in your configuration, and these are just rough guidelines, but it sort of gets you in the in the vicinity of does this does this work? Obviously, doing uh, more uh, elaborate analysis of you know, in terms of FEA uh, is is very much uh, performed on a regular basis for force limiting uh, vibration fixture uh, installations. Uh, and again, just showing you a little bit more, they followed uh, all the preload. Uh, techniques that I mentioned before. You can see the force ring and the force sensors mounted around the ring. You can see now the top and bottom plates, they're aluminum, and uh, basically using the preload bolt that they uh, they, they developed themselves, and then, uh, yeah, putting it all together and preloading it in four steps of 25% each and uh, so forth. Now, calibration of, of this fixture, obviously, this is a 2.6 meter ring fairly large, okay? Uh, so what do you do? Uh, a lot of times what's done is you do a, uh, a sweep below the first resonance of the fixture, and you, it's either a, a sweep or say a dwell. And what you're doing is you're comparing the mass uh, that you've actually measured of all the components on the force sensors to the apparent mass that you get from, uh, from the force uh, over the acceleration uh, calculation in your vibration test. 
Now, one thing I wanted to point out is when you're doing just the top fixture, okay, of the of the um, uh, of the uh, of the vibration fixture, uh, and you don't have a mass simulator on yet, you have to take into care that the actual sensors themselves, you in your mass calculation, you take half the mass of the sensor and half the mass of the preload bolt, and that should factor in. We had a case recently where a customer was 16% off in terms of their, their apparent mass calculation to the mass calculation. And it all, because it was a low mass scenario, they didn't factor in the half the mass of the sensor and half the mass of the bolt. And then it came out to within like 1% of the, uh, of the uh, expected value. So it was uh, definitely uh, something to keep in mind when you're doing calibration. Lastly, um, you know, uh, doing in-situ calibration uh, using four sensors. Uh, maybe for small installations, it makes sense, but for these large shaker or large uh, platforms, uh, not really used in the industry, okay? So a lot of times the, uh, the shaker test comparing the apparent mass versus actual mass is the preferred approach to calibrate. And lastly, uh, force limited uh, test here, just showing four sensors. Going to the lab amps that I showed previously, the 5167s, these are quasi-static. So you're able to use these amps for for uh, preload, as well as each output. There's uh, four outputs per lab amp. Uh, so each of the 12 channels are routed directly to the M plus P uh, shaker controller system. So you have complete visibility of all 12 channels. Everything's preloaded, everything's set up, calibration was performed, and you're ready to go uh, with your test. At that point, I'm gonna throw it over to Chris Wilcox uh, for his uh, part. All right, so thanks again, Bill. Welcome, everybody. Uh, you can see my screen, okay, I assume. All right, thanks again. We're gonna talk a little bit about the M plus P International uh, Vibration Control System and how we've made some changes over the years to help you along with force limited vibration testing, as well as to uh, Reduce some of your cabling and some fault areas. A little background, I think Bill gave some really good uh, information. The uh, started out in 1993 uh, with Ter Dr. Terry Chardon. He uh, talked to uh, my personal boss, Guido Strutt, and they started working on force limited vibration testing for random testing. This was also going on at Goddard and some other places for sign testing. Again, like uh, Bill mentioned, a shaker has infinite impedance, whereas the rocket or launch vehicle does have some uh, give or compliance to it. Additionally, there's also a limitation on the slip tables and the V-bands that mount the satellites. And in this case, you're looking at an overturning moment that could be either destructive or very uh, interruptive to your testing. M plus P has been doing this for 41 years total. Um, we were started in 1980. We added 1980s, we added um, multiple channel notching or limiting. And in 86, we started with a Unix system. And then in 1999, when I started with the company, we moved to Windows based vibration control systems. Now, some other major points here, but more recently, we've been adding. Uh, some advanced technology since computers and hardware have come a long ways. So in the particular case of what I'll be showing you today, we're using the MMP Vibe Runners. We can store high channel counts all in control with absolutely no limitations uh, on the control algorithm. And this has been proven out in many facilities. The um, uh, this includes both sign and random, um, out from 5 to 2,000 hertz, although most sign tests typically limit at about 150 hertz maximum. Additionally, we also have the ability to store all your channels at high sampling rates, regardless of your control rate. So if you're testing to 100 hertz, there's no problem recording at 8,000 or 16,000 samples per second for up to 500 channels. 
again, with the math, um, these are some of the things that we've added to our advanced notching to, again, reduce some of the complexities, and I'll show you that in a couple of slides. But the math is the same as Bill showed. Summing of the forces in line, overturning moment, and then root sum squared when you want to find the vector, the absolute vector. Some of the testing that I performed many years ago, we used the external charge amps with summing junctions. Um, all channels were patched into individual charge amps, then from the charge amps into a summing junction. Um, this worked, but there is a big loss of sensor integrity. If a single sensor or cable goes bad or is intermittent, typically the summing junction will hide it from the end user. And you'll see in a slide or two that that's happened in the past. Again, the same type of thing. This was simplified a little bit. Um, where Kistler did come up with some uh, built-in summing junctions with charge amps so we could reduce it. However, if you look at this plot, you're looking at 24 sensors. Each individual sensor has three axes and you're getting four out. So again, you were still hiding the individual sensors. There was no way to separate force one from force two. Uh, it all came in as one sum or one moment. Additionally, on these earlier uh, systems, some of the summing, the overturning moment was calculated on a per axis basis with no uh, absolute maximum overturning moment. Okay. What M plus B International has done is we've incorporated all the math and the summing into the controller. What this has done is greatly reduce the number of actual fault paths that you would have. You simply have a force sensor taken directly into the M plus B system or through the lab amps for the charge. What this allows you to do is monitor each and every sensor for overloads or open channels. Also, because we can do it all digitally, there is no need to repatch in between runs. For example, switching from X to Y or to Z, we simply repatch in the control outcome. An additional benefit is now all the sensitivities that are used and all the ranges and all the serial numbers and particular parts are stored within the result file, which makes great for traceability and documentation. 2014, we did run a test um, using an existing system. And what we did find on the first run, very first run of the day with our new system was that the forces didn't match. And what it turned out to be was there was a bad cable. The summing junction had hidden this. The sensitivity was adjusted to calibrate it. However, with a bad sensor, nobody ever caught it. Mm -hmm. So the benefits of using today's high technology systems, number one is the simplification of cable. Um, this in the real test world is very, very critical as we, I'm sure many people have noticed that cabling seems to be one of the biggest problems that you run into. All your force measurements are monitored and stored. You can then use them for center of gravity calculations. We also can see each individual one and look for any anomalies. Um, everything else is pretty obvious. Average acceleration limits, off-axis limits. The other one that we can do now is off-axis uh, monitoring so that if your force sensor, for example, cannot be mounted in the exact orientation of your XY, it has to be mounted off either for cabling reasons, we can adjust for that in the software as well. Everything is available online and the standard Alarms or boards that we've used for 30 years are still available. And this is for sign and random testing. I'm going to be showing you a little bit of our software, a couple more slides. I guess it was last 2019, customer came to us and was looking for an all-in-one solution. Um, the reason we chose the Kistler lab amps was simple. They offered the quasi-static mode that had the most experience in force limiting. And the quasi-static mode with the very high dynamic range of the 
charge amps allows us to do the preload on the z-axis or vertical uh, compression preloading. They also offer the same model in a, quasi, in a dynamic mode, which helps with the cost. Since all your sensitivities and ranges are set within the software, this again is stored with the result file and allows for traceability. The standard setup is similar to what Bill showed us. Um, interestingly enough, these started out with typically four, six, and then eight. Now we've got 24 sensor uh, systems, which get even more complex. So again, some of the simplification does matter. Um, little note here um, that people do forget the the four sensors obviously have an XY axis. If you were to use all the same ones, all of the connectors have to come out the same way, or you have to index them by 90 degrees. Uh, Kistler does make a sensor that you can invert. This makes it a little bit easier for the ring. But what I want to point out is that it's very important to note the polarity since you're summing forces. Um, if one's negative, one's positive, they will null each other out. So we do have the sum force, which would be your, your in-axis vibration test typically. So X, Y on a slip table, Z on a vertical. Um, very simply, I'll show you this in a minute. We just sum the forces up and we control a notch to that profile. A single plane over or a single moment. This is about one axis. This is a very simple system. You just put in your dimensions, your moment arms and your individual force sensors. I'll show you that. And what we call the pure overturning moment calculation, this is regardless of axis, but for this we do need to know the X and Y components. And the software will calculate online while you run the test, the absolute vector of your overturning moment. Critical if you are have any center of gravity off center or for some other reason your, your system is twisting or not going around a perfect moment angle. Unfortunately, I don't have a large simulator and 24 force sensors, so I'm gonna be doing this with a closed loop control, but it's a simulated system. Um, so I basically put four force sensors on there, each with three axes, so I can sum the Y and the X and the Z, and then I can also show the overturning moment. A little horrible picture. Oh. Last night I put together Newtons. I apologize for the change in plot. I personally don't work in Newtons so much, so bear with me. Um, what I've done is I've done a closed loop here, but I've adjusted the sensitivities to make it appear to be a real test. This gives us slightly different values for each channel. Um, and this is basically, I'm gonna try to run to 100 Newtons and notch. And let me see if this works fast. Of course not. There we go. This is the vibration control user interface. I set it up to run. I'm gonna first just show you exactly what we're doing here. Now, this would be a calibration mode where we hold at five hertz, might even be three or four hertz, depending on your shaker's ability. And what I've got is up here, I've got a target, a reference target of, I believe, four. However, we're, we're not going to make it to four because we're going to notch over here on the simulated force. So we're basically notching at 410. If we look, we can see that the overturning moment at this point is very low. Time domain, we can switch. And then I add it one accelerometer. Give you an idea how this is set up. This is our typical setup window. First, you're going to enter your profile. In this case, I added some shape to it to make it uh, a little more interesting when we try to do the notching. Uh, many spacecraft level tests, or the first couple, will be very, very low levels. Uh, 0.25 Gs, I guess, 2.5 newton meters per second squared. 
for the individual channels. As you can see now, I've only got a four channel lab amp, but this is where we would set our lab amp up. Uh, I did put some values in here to give us an idea. And then each individual force channel will be its own channel, have its own sensitivity. If you wanted to, you could put a serial number, model number, and this is all stored within the result file. I have a 16 channel controller with me. Uh, this is not limited to 16 by any means. We're capable to go 256, 512, depending on the PC configuration. So how do we set, them up, set up in each individual sum force? Uh, very simple. Again, this can have a shape. I didn't put much of one in here, but I could let me say 15. Hertz and let's go 420. Give it a little shape here, 600. And you keep continue on putting a profile on. For the sum forces, one thing that is important is your units. Um, the software will forbid you from mixing meters per second squared and newtons on the same sum for obvious reasons. And down here we would input the individual force sensors. So in this case, I have four in-axis force sensors. I'm going to just add 1x, 2x, 3x, 4x. And we go here. Do the same thing for the y-axis and z-axis. Now, of course, one of the things I've done here is if you look back up here, I've put a negative sensitivity in for my force. Um, the actual sensors are all connected together. So I needed something to give me that 180 degrees of phase shift. Um, the other thing we can do is we can manually create a overturning moment by where we have the weighting factor over here. We would just put in the distance or the moment arm. And of course, your vertical axis for sensors. Uh, then we get to the more advanced. Here, which is the moment notching, I should show that. So here we're going to enter in our vertical force sensors, but we're also going to put in an X and Y coordinate system, and this is so that they can perform the uh, pure overturning moment uh, force calculation. So this is regardless of angle. Typically, this actually only has to be set once for your lateral axis because the uh, Calculation is the same no matter if you're in the X or the Y. I should put out recently that we've added bridge, bridge modules if you do want to do strain gauges. Okay, so ready to run. Turn the hold off. So as we sweep, you're going to watch. It's going to continue notching on the sum force. It's going to give you a small entry in here. Uh, once it gets out of this particular notch, it should go back to the control reference. And then it will hit the overturning moment. Now, see in the time domain that I've got my Z axis down here off all the Z, all the X, Y force here, and then the summed force here. Now we are notching on the overturning moment. I can't see. And at last, we should notch on. And we, well, then we notch on the accelerometer at the last. Obviously, these notches typically on a real test go back and forth. It's quite active, but I wanted to give you an overview. Just wanna... Now, during this test, we've been running throughput. So we shall have so you will have all your individual forces, and this is the big change from the um, classical system where these were all hidden from you. And we'll have our sum force for the in-axis. 
Now the Z should be low because of the two being out of phase. And then we have a simple over turning moment calculation, which should be similar to this. So this would be your standard, of course, your control algorithm, control channel, where it shows the different test modes. We also have the history, um, which can be, it tells you which channel, in this case, this was 19, which was the summed x-axis. This is the reference is zero. This was again 19, and then this was the overturning moment, channel 21. And then finally, the accelerometer on channel 16. Another big benefit is that, although it takes a second to load up, we have all the time domain for all the channels. Zoom in. Of course, it's going to look pretty perfect because and you can see the time domain data. Walk through. So that was basically a sign test. Very quickly, I'm going to show you a random test. See how that's set up first. Random test is very similar. One of the features of the MMP software is all test modes are basically laid out in the same setup files. So you have a reference, specimen, schedule, how long it takes, <coughs> and then the channel setup, which is very similar. Again, same idea. We set it to a notch channel for channel 16, with overturning moment with the weighting. Major difference here being that we now enter in Newton's squared per hertz for the forces. And for the overturning moment, it's Newton meters squared per hertz. And a second, it should start up. Now, if you look, I have so in this case, over this frequency range from 320 to 300 and 400, we are notching on the force of the x-axis on the overturning moment, so notching here. And if we look up at the actual control, uh, this would typically be uh, four channels averaged together. And then we are notching, so we're slightly below target here. Of course, we can always look at our drive signal. We'll you'll see the, the notching happen. We can also look at the error signal. Whoop, that's not going to work. There we go. Right. Again, throughput's running. If you look down on the left-hand side, it shows you that you are storing the data. I can import the test, complete. And of course, look at our data. Can't get. All right. There we go. Get to the maximum button. You can go through your data. And it, uh, for random data, we do have RMS over time for your control. 
for your drive signal. Let's see how consistently you're controlling. And then in the time domain, obviously, you're going to look fairly similar for all your individual channels. I wanted to thank everybody. And I'll give it back to you, Pascal. Yes, great. Thanks a lot for this great overview. So we had some questions. So the first one was about the uh, control loop time. So how long do we need to control the loop time? So for example, if we have a shake with a speed frequency of um, zero up to 100 hertz. So the control loop time in sign you would set by your damping or what used to be called compression speed. Um, you can set that. Uh, the faster your compression speed, the more likely you are to have instabilities. Slower your uh, compression speed, the slower your response, more likely to overshoot. Um, it's optimized that as we know, but um, this is user selectable. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Then another question about the cables. So one guy worried about the cables because most of the time the cables add an error to the measurement. So which cable should he use for the force sensors? Well, um, the 1698AA uh, is the preferred cable used in uh, force limiting uh, applications. So it basically is a V3 connector uh, on the uh, sensor side to uh, a breakout of three BNCs. And that cable is also available in three uh, micro dot or 1032s. And that's the 1698AE version, AE version. And the last question, what time constant to be used for the sign test? Is it short or long? Short, always short. The long time constant is only used for preloading the uh, force sensor. And we have a, uh, an app note for that, how to do it. Great, thanks a lot. So if you have any other questions, do not hesitate to contact us via email. And thanks a lot for your attention and have a nice day or night. See you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.